This time I have a Sony EVC3 8mm VCR that was shipped in from a viewer to have it looked at and repaired. Now, normally if I see a machine that's got this kind of damage, I'm telling someone to walk away because there's many things wrong with this. It has mechanical problems, it has electronic problems, and it has a problem with the video head. But uh, we're going to pu push through and uh, see if we can actually make this one work. And hopefully it'll work out for me too because I could get burned. This is an EVC3 that's obviously got a problem. So let's uh, see what it's doing or what it's not doing and see if we can get this one to work. Little 8mm player, kind of like the one that I have. Actually, it's identical to the one that I have. And mine even looks like new now because I was able to salvage the glass off of one that got smashed in transport because the guy that sent it to me didn't wrap it up and it just got totally just destroyed. So I was able to salvage. Oh, the only thing I could salvage out of the thing was the, the glass. Everything else was just in pieces. I've been doing some maintenance on my computer today. Email. Getting rid of email. <clears throat> This is the problem that I always have here is just unwanted spam and email and stuff. And uh, our man down in Florida, the guy that's got some severe psychiatric problems, who complains to everybody but Santa Claus about uh, spam that he gets, so he says, he doesn't get any spam. He's the goofball that uh, requests to be notified when new videos are posted. And then when new videos get posted, he writes to everybody but Santa Claus about spam. And the problem with this dickhead is that he sends his complaints out through third-party Google Cloud compliance and all that shit. Who then in turn email me to tell me that a, a complaint has been filed and fill up my email box with sometimes 30, 40, 50, 60 messages a day because I get all of his complaints about Fran Blanche and and uh, Linus Tech and everybody else, uh, EEV Blog, everybody else that he's uh, that's on his hit list, I get this, I get carbon copies to all of his complaints, and of course I don't reply to any of them because replying to them, Google will then turn around and send a message back to him that I've made a reply and that'll just confirm my email address and I'll get even more spam. But over the years, I've just been deleting all these messages. Unbeknown to me, they weren't really being deleted. I just wasn't seeing them on my screen. And I'm wondering, where did all my hard drive space go? I got all these goddamn messages that are sitting on my hard drive that I've deleted, but really weren't deleted. So I've spent the last couple of hours this morning just compacting the database, trying to get rid of thousands upon thousands of messages. I'm down to around 3,000 now. But, um, yeah, these messages go back years that I that I deleted from my client. And actually, what happened is I was running a, uh, I was running Windows, Windows, uh, or Microsoft Office, Outlook. And Outlook, for some reason, decided it no longer wanted to work. Could not contact the server. Could not send or receive any messages. So I went and installed Thunderbird. And Thunderbird somehow went out on the web to Gmail, which is where everything is now stored in the Gmail universe. Even my ISP's email is now done through Gmail. And found every backup copy of messages that were even like 10 years old that were still out there in the cloud that just got re-imported into my computer. So I've spent hours trying to clear out my email boxes and... Um, get things working on my computer again because um, if you're wondering why I haven't been responding a lot to uh, messages on YouTube oh that's a that's a YouTube problem see normally when someone sends me a question or something on YouTube I usually check this on my phone I don't sit in front of the computer a lot and do email I usually do it on my phone and I'll get a message from a viewer and I can just click reply and it'll take me over to the, the video where the comment is and I can type a reply and click save. But uh, I guess uh, maybe a month or so ago, YouTube did a forced update 
to the YouTube app. Not YouTube Studio, but to the YouTube app. And now, nine times out of ten, if I try to respond to a message, my phone will lock up. And I can't even close down. I can't even close it. Nothing happens. The only thing I can do is hold the power button down and restart my phone. Nine times out of ten. If I can find a message in YouTube Studio, I can reply to it there, but if I try to do a direct response, it won't work. And there's been a couple of updates to YouTube uh, since then, but they haven't fixed the problem. Uh, I guess YouTube is no longer supporting Android 10, which is what my phone runs, and I'm not about to upgrade my phone. It's, uh, I, have a, I have a brand new phone it's just sitting in a box, but until my phone actually dies, it's going to sit there. I just charge it up once in a while to make sure it stays charged and then it's going to sit there. <clears throat> this guide is in the wrong position for starters. We've got one guide that's down, we've got one guide that's up, and we've got a pinch roller that's kind of stuck on this thing. So we have a mechanical problem on this one. Before I even go any further, might as well deal with that. But anyway, um, you know, it's, uh, it's like the app world, right? Why issue updates for things that work? You, up, you issue an update and things sometimes don't work as planned because you break one thing when you fix another. And I guess the, uh, the, the developers are no longer testing their apps on the older OSs, just assuming that everybody in the world is upgraded. And well, people don't upgrade, you know, people don't upgrade uh, uh, every six months. Maybe some people do. Maybe some people that uh, just have to have the latest tech upgrade, but uh, not me. I, I've got uh, I got an old phone. It's a it's a it's a Samsung S9 that I've been using for I don't know, I think I've had it six years, but um, I don't see any need to upgrade it until it breaks, and uh, I'm not going to upgrade it. Okay, first things first. I'm going to pull the mechanism out on this, and we'll see what damages this guide. Obviously, is disconnected. This, the pin here that holds this guide in place has worked its way loose. You can see this little. This is what holds the guide to the to the linkage. This little pin here, and it's, it's raised up. You look on the other side. This one here is is not. You see it's down because it's sitting in the linkage. The linkage is right there. You can see it, and this guide is out of place. As is this guide. This one should be back as well, but it's jammed, probably because it's. The guide should have come back and pulled it into position. Uh, hasn't. So first things first, we're going to pull the mechanism apart so that I can bring this guide back where it belongs and get it in place. And perhaps that's all that's wrong with this machine. That's wishful thinking. Anyway, there we go. That should lift up a bit. Two brown, red. I want to get the right one. Unplug the right one here. And unplug the uh, voting motor. Just undo that plug there first. I think that's the loading motor there. If I'm not mistaken, let's see if that's the right one. I think that's the right one. Yeah, that's the right one. I'm going to uh, unplug the loading motor so I can apply some power to it and uh, manually operate the loading motor take this little bit of tape off the top. The reason we unplug it is so that I'm not going to back feed anything into the circuitry. I don't want to send any voltage back into the drive ICs or anything that could damage them. So I unplug the motor and then peel away the, uh, the tape that's over the top here so that I can access the terminals and then I can just give it a couple volts. 13 should be enough. No, just kidding. We'll dial this down to about uh, 4 or 5 volts. I just want to move it slowly. I don't want it to go very fast. 
and we'll limit it down to only a couple hundred milliamps because I don't want anything to jam. So I'm just setting my power supply up here. We'll set the current down to maybe 200 milliamps. 300 milliamps. Okay. I just want to move the mechanism a little bit as I want to get this pinch roller free so that I can pull it back into place. That's the wrong way. There, now the pinch roller is up free, you see. I released the pinch roller. Now, if I can get that linkage and get that the guide pin back into the linkage, gonna find it here first. It's somewhere in here. It's probably swung around and out of the way. But we'll bring the guide back. And he's going to find that linkage wherever the heck it went. It, well, I did see it down here, but it's it's kind of moved. It's probably sitting out to the side now. If I turn it up this way, it might drop back where I need it to be. Now, I could pull the entire mechanism apart, but I don't want to because that just makes here. more work to time everything. I've got my, my dental pick. And we'll see if we can move it into position. I know some of you may like to see that, but uh, I don't do it unless I absolutely have to. I don't know how well you guys can see it, but it's, it's right here. You can see the lever. This is what I have to get to go back into the uh, guide and lock it in place. But it's right there. That pin has to go through that hole. So we're going to pull this back. And in order to do that without things flying around here, I'm going to remove the, the spring that pulls the, the uh, pinch roller into place. So we'll just take the spring off the top here. That allows that to go back like that and out of the way. That way I can, otherwise it's going to push the guide back forward. Now I can try to bring the guide back down and try to get it to go into the, the actual linkage without having to take this thing apart any more than I have to. This is the tricky part, getting this to line up. But uh, it is possible to do it without removing the chassis and creating a whole bunch of other headaches. I may have to take this apart. I'm just hoping I don't have to. Just because it's a pain in the butt to do it if you have to take it all apart. Push the pin up. Now what I'm trying to do here, I don't, know if it's, I don't know if you can see it, if you look down here closely, you'll see the linkage and you'll see the guide. So the little copper piece here, this is part of the guide. This linkage has to slide in between over that hole. And this is the linkage here. might be able to remove this little plate here just to make it a little easier to get to. I think this piece comes off. magnetize the screwdriver so that I can remove this little bracket that way I can actually see what I'm doing and get at what I need to get at this piece will come out maybe not probably got to remove the capstan motor to get at that would rather not if I don't have to
reach underneath it and grab the guide and move the guide into place by hand. There it is. What I need to do is I need to lift up that the uh, copper band there a bit just so that the guide can slide or the the, um, the linkage can slide under it. It might be hard to see but you get the drift of what I'm doing. Lift that up a bit and pull this back into place. Oops, I slipped. Set that right over top of that hole. Slide the linkage back in place. Got to go under here. And then once I get it lined up, I can push the pin through from the other side and it should lock in place. Just got to make sure that I've got the, uh, the linkage here right over top of that hole. So that it locks it in between. It is tedious, as you can see. But it can be done without tearing the whole mechanism apart. That's the whole goal, is to not have to tear the whole mechanism apart, because then it becomes a much more labor-intensive operation. There, I've got the two of them linked now. You can see when I move the guide. Now, if I hold that in place and I push the pin down on the other side... There, we got the linkage. There you go, you see? You can see the linkage moving. You see the linkage on here when I move it? You can see it? Moving the gear, so the linkage in, is in place. Now, I can reconnect a few things here, and uh, we can try it out and make sure it works, and then I will put some uh, glue on top of it to prevent it from, from uh, pulling forward once again. Let's plug this back in for now. If you're wondering what's going on in the background, I have NASA TV going. I figure I can probably be safe with that running on the TV without having to get to any type of copyright. I was watching the eclipse yesterday on NASA TV because I had the best view. We, we, it only, we only had like 29% here and it was cloudy. I, I've, seen a, I've seen an eclipse before uh, when we had it, I think it was 90 97% here, or 95% a few years ago, we had a good one here, and I got nice pictures of it the last time, which was, I think, 2017. I tell you, though, that solar eclipse sure brought out all the nut jobs. Heard on the radio yesterday about some woman in Florida that God told her to go and shoot people. So she went and got out her gun and started shooting people. So we're gonna make sure this this pin stays down all the way because that's what holds this in place. Is these two pins, and then we'll put. 
put this spring back on for the the controller that holds the controller in place and now we'll apply some power and watch the uh, the guides move back into position so we'll go one way here which way are we going make the connection here come on See, now they're moving. That's how it's supposed to move. So we'll just reset this back to its uh, home position. And I'll just get some glue. And we'll put some glue down onto the top of this to stop it from moving. And then uh, I can test the unit. So for that, we're going to use good old crazy glue, super glue, whatever you want to call it. We're going to put some glue on top of that um, guide. I think I'll I think I'll remove the pressure roller here just for a minute, just just so that it's out of the way, so that I can get the glue in here without uh, getting on anything else. And I think we should check on here is that this this white roller hasn't cracked, but it seems to be okay. Open up a new tube of Dollar Store Special. This stuff comes sealed like this so you screw it on the top and it opens it so it stays fresh but once I open it of course it's going to uh, start to lose its lose its strength we'll just put a little bit onto the end of my my little dropper here and put a drop right there to hold that in place and we'll do the same on the other one because the other one will also come loose if we're not careful they'll both just do the same thing so we just put a little bit of glue on top here that'll hold that pin in place prevent it from ever coming loose again and that should be a permanent fix for this machine so I'm just going to let that glue set up there for a bit, and then uh, we'll, uh, the guides are also loose. they got to be adjusted, as you'll see here. The uh, guides themselves have all worked their way loose, so we need to do, do an alignment. At least this one's loose, so we'll have to do a tape path alignment on here. But uh, I'm going to let this thing set up for a few minutes, and uh, while it's doing that, we'll get prepped for um, testing it out. Put the two little screws in that hold that bracket back in place that I loosened off just so that I could work under it. So this unit will get lubricated before I put it together. We'll, we'll put some new grease in here while I've got it apart. As it uh, it certainly can use it. I can plug this plug back in because the next time this thing powers up it'll be under its own power. These are gears here that I'm just throwing some lubricant on. I'll also put lubricant into the rails on both sides. And just for those that need to know, it's MG Chemicals 8461 White Lithium Grease. This is uh, the stuff that I'm using. It's essentially the same stuff as um, the old 
molly coat, which I no longer have. And this is what, what's in here, okay? It's got uh, petroleum distillates, lithium, and zinc, uh, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, number 12, hydrooxyterate, I guess that's what it is. Anyway, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, this is um, what I've been using for years. Like, literally for 40-odd years. It's like or close to it. Uh, I used that, um, I used to use that Molly Coat, and people would always ask where I got Molly Coat. Well, the Molly Coat stuff that I used was always, um, it came as part of a repair kit from Mitsubishi when you bought a new pinch roller for their VHS machines that used it. It came with a, a, a packet, each one came with a packet of grease. And well, one pack it had enough grease in it to do probably five machines, and we did a lot of repairs on those machines when I was in the business. Like I used to fix hundreds of those machines. Same with the Sony's, the uh, the Sony VHS machines that broke the the pinch arm and froze up because the black grease that they used at the time turned into concrete basically it turned like cement froze everything up and when you bought a pinch arm kit from either Sony Sony gave you a little packet of the green grease that they replaced it with which was the same stuff it was a lithium grease and Mitsubishi used the yellow molly coat I ended up with so much molly coat because I never used the entire pack when I lubricated the mechanism I used about a third of it so I had always had tons of and tons of extra packages and I think a lot of shops probably just toss them out they would use what they had to out of the pack and then they would just throw the rest out but I used to keep them and I went through so many of them that I had probably a hundred hundred packages of that stuff that uh, when I left the business I brought it home I used to bring it home I used to bring stuff home because I just had so much I left a bunch of it at the shop when I left but I had already had a bag of probably I think I probably had 20 or, or so packs at home and that's what I've been using for the past 10 years or so I've been using those up but uh, I finally got through them all and I had to go buy some so I went back and bought the, the stuff that I've been using for years which is again the same stuff it's not that expensive that tube I think was about I don't know 15 bucks maybe anyway let's put the let's put the spring back on here for the pinch roller and I'll plug this unit in and the mechanism should automatically reset itself. If everything goes as planned, it should unload the, the tape guides. Ah, just like that. Now, we'll get a tape, a garbage tape first, and we'll see how it plays, and then I'll do my alignment and get the video working on this one. Fingers crossed there's nothing else wrong with it. Turns on, that's good. Now what's it going to do now? Is it going to finish this loading cycle or what is going to happen? It seems to have stalled. That's because this tape is quite badly damaged. The drum did not appear to come on. Oh, there it goes. I think our mode switch needs to be cleaned as well. But, will it play? Will it play? Do I have a picture? I have a picture with... Um, a clogged head. That's what I have. I have a clogged head. Well, it looks like a clogged head. It could be an alignment problem too. Probably is an alignment problem. This tape is uh, again. Whoops. Where's my Where is my alignment tool? I know I've got one here somewhere. I can just use a screwdriver to tweak this. But I know I got a clogged head, so let's just uh, use the fingernail on the head. Try to clear the head off first. It's actually a little more serious than a clogged head. In fact, it's a whole lot more serious than a clogged head. Is we're going to find out. A broken head. 
Okay, I got one head that's clogged still. Again, I hope it's not broken. All right, both guides have been are bad. Both of them are loose. One was screwed all the way down. I haven't put the scope on it yet. I'm just trying to get it close by eye here. And we may have capacitor problems on this as well. But uh, we'll see what happens, whether I can get this close. I've also misplaced my little fine-tuning tool. Must be Maybe it's dropped on the floor. I'm pretty sure I used it last on the bench here. But I don't see it. And normally I put it in a little case in my uh, toolbox, but it's not there. So it's either it's either somewhere on the bench here or it's inside the house because I was using it for... Um, I think I used it on that video I did on aligning with the scope. But uh, I think I might have used it in the house after that because I was doing some tape recoveries which are normally done in the house. But that's okay. I haven't looked for it. It's here somewhere. I'll let you in on a little secret right now. It's much more serious in alignment. Okay, we're getting better. Uh, you're not getting any better. It's more serious in alignment. And it's more serious in capacitors. This is uh, still a ways away from giving me any type of picture that uh, would be acceptable. Okay, part of the problem here is this has got a servo problem as it's playing an LP, it's an SP tape. But as you can see, the machine itself it clearly says it's LP, right? So it's uh, playing at the wrong speed. That's one of the reasons why it's not uh, gonna track properly. We have a servo problem on this. Looking at the good old scope, one of the reasons I may be uh, in the wrong speed is it looks like one of the heads isn't putting out any RF. We're only seeing one head. And that is likely why it's detecting the wrong speed. This may have a bad head, unfortunately. But I might have a head that can be subbed on this. Because I do believe I have another one of these around here that uh, got damaged in freight. So we may have a bad head on this. We'll try running the cleaning tape through it and just see what happens. Uh, it could be the B head because this is a three head machine so it's got uh, clear playback to um, play good freeze frame. How that works is it's got so you got three heads, you got a flying erase and you got uh, a dual azimuth head so you got a uh, dual azimuth head here flying erase here and a single head over here. You got your A plus a B and a B over here. That's how it is. Or actually it gets us an A and a B plus an A over here for the field. It shows right here. This is the gain control for head number one, head number two, and the special effect. And how it works is normally when you're playing back video you've got one field is from the A head and one field is from the B head. But when you put it in freeze frame it uses the B head as well as the second B head or A head or whatever. I guess it's the A. Uh, it uses the A plus the second A. That's what it's, so you get a single field. So even if it was the servo was running at the wrong speed, when you hit pause, it's going to turn off one head and switch the other one on, but still use the other one from the other side. So if it was the, the B head that was bad, right, the one that's got the double azimuth, and you put it in pause, you'd, you'd, you'd have the, the A side of that plus the, the A side from the other side that would give you a clear freeze frame. But if the A side head, the one on the opposite side, went bad, then you'd still have a bad freeze frame, which is what we've got. Or had. I haven't checked it since I put in the cleaning tape in. But, um, and of course, because it's only getting half the signal, it's, it, it won't detect the proper speed. And we end up with a picture that looks, well half snow and when I put the scope on it we're seeing only one waveform and that's exactly what I see if I switch my trigger we're over here right we've got one one head has got no signal one head's got signal the other head's got no signal switch my trigger my slope you see one head is stronger than the other it's 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 hunting trying to find it's trying to find a good signal but you can see clearly right there 
that one head is missing a signal. And the reason it's the reason it's doing reason it's the envelope is changing like that. Am I triggering on channel two? I guess I am, yes. The reason why it's changing like this is it's running at half speed. So the servo is trying to is trying to lock in, but we have a loss of signal. So it's never going to track up because it's running at half the speed. If I put it in pause, again you're missing half the signal, right? You got one head, the other head's got nothing there. If I put it into search, it searches, but again we're missing half of the signal. So I think we got a bad head on this one. What I can do is I do have another drum out of one of these machines, a complete drum assembly, and uh, I'll put this drum into this machine and just see whether it fixes the problem. I'm pretty sure it's just the head that's bad. And uh, you know, if the fellow that owns this wants to buy the drum from me, maybe we can work out a price. I don't really want to sell the part because I have a I have a couple machines that could use it myself. So I don't really like to sell replacement parts that I could use but if he wants it bad enough maybe I'll make an exception but it's just three screws to hold it in place so we'll pop this one out and replace it just so I can see whether I've got a picture on it and uh, prove that that's what the fault is it sure looks like that it could be something in the preamp but it, it sure looks like it's the uh, the drum the head itself as I say it, it's it's fairly easy to swap it out I just have to remove a couple plugs and uh, a couple screws. There's three screws that hold it in place and uh, I think three plugs and it just unplugs so it's uh, it's, it's pretty easy to replace. It's, it's easier to replace the entire drum just undo this black cord here and there's a red plug at the back. It's easier to replace the entire drum than it is to change the head. That's what I'm getting at. Like I wouldn't bother to change the head for testing just because it's a lot of work to do it. But to change the drum, all I have to do is just undo three connectors. Pop that out. Pop out this this plug at the back, the red one. God, this light. I'm starting to get frustrated with this light. It's always in the way. Every time I go to move, it's hitting me in the head or shining in my face. And I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting grumpy comes to working on this this small shit <laughs> but um, you know where I'm coming from right it's 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 faster to change the whole entire part than it is just to, to, to change the upper drum even though the upper drum is not that big a deal to change on here it's uh, it's pretty easy you just undo the the solder for the the four heads basically so you get eight solder connections to undo and then you pull the head off of it and put it on But um, so it's fairly easy to do that, but it's, it's just faster just to pull the entire head drum out and just swap it over because I say there's just a few wires that holds it in place and a few screws. So there's uh, one screw here. And another screw over here. and a third one over there and then this whole assembly will just drop out and then we just turn it outside and just lift the head drum out trust me it does lift out it does lift out just bend that up a bit out of the way and it'll just pop out of there making a liar out of me it does just pop out trust me it does just pop out just like that Gotta make sure oh, it might help if I undo the wire clip just like that it pops out okay there's one out of the way and we'll put the other one in and again it goes in just exactly like the other one came out just drop it through the top pull the wires through drop it in place and put in the screws And it's just that easy. Sort of. 
got to get it into the right position. Just like that. Put the screws back in. And then pop in the signal cable, lock it back in place, and the servo plug, the, the uh, one's the FG plug for the speed sensor, and the other one is the other plug that goes around here and kind of gets fished out of the way, but not too worried about that right now because this is just for testing. And if it if it ends up staying in here, then we'll 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 put it in a little better, but. Just for now, I just need to get it around the back side here so I can plug it in. There we go. Plug that one in, plug this one in, and then we can uh, plug the power in and uh, see if we've improved the picture. If it's still bad, then it's going to be something in the preamp. But judging by how I've seen um, 8mm heads fail in the past, they they tend to fail pretty much instantaneously and again I don't know the history um, the fellow that owns this may have been, been into it and been tinkering around with it and may have buggered something up or that guide that was loose there may have made contact with the head when it failed when the guide came loose so that's what I don't know but I'm going to find out pretty quick power on and it's still the same, so it's not the head. It's got to be something in the preamp then, because it's doing exactly the same thing. I, th I think this preamp on this particular machine has surface mounted caps. I'm pretty sure I changed out some on mine. So we may have a cap problem on here. Let's just pull the preamp out. I'm not going to swap the preamp with the other one because if it's surface mounted caps, they're probably bad in the other one. I Pretty sure I changed out caps on mine like years ago. So it might be some leaky surface mounted caps in here that's causing it to not to switch to the other head because we're only seeing signal from one head. This should just pop out. off of it yeah yeah this one's got surface mounted caps in it as I thought just see if we can unplug this and we'll just go through this preamp they're leaking I can see it so there's our fault we got leaky caps on here so I can put the other head drum back in for that matter it's not going to be that let's uh, pop this out first and we'll fix the preamp there we go all right so we got um, Got some bad caps in here for sure. For sure. Not that I needed to take the other half off, but. So, what's happening on this one is the head switching signal is. is getting detected here but it's not switching the head and that's why we're seeing just the one head it's not switching it could be the IC but it's gonna be one of these caps I'm pretty sure let's just check them and see this one's leaking here it's probably just that one there you can see this one's this one's got crap leaking out of it but let's change them out so if we look at the ESR meter that one's open Nine ohms. That's a 47 microfarad. So it's gotta be a lot lower than that. Here's a 22, nine ohms. Here's a 22, 50, 16 ohms. Another 22, 5.3. This one's open, of 15 ohms. 68 ohms. Uh, yeah, these are all bad. 26 ohms. 
So I got to change out these surface mounted caps. That will hopefully get this one running, and I can I'll put the original head back in here as well. I take them out that way because there's no chance of damaging the board. Other methods that people use, twisting them, etc., etc., can uh, do severe damage to the traces on the board. So I always take mine out just like that, and then remove the the remaining pieces with my solder iron. Solder these back in with 6040 solder, and there's plenty of room in this can to put in through hole caps. I don't need to go to um, surface mounted and much better uh, much better life expectancy with uh, conventional caps. So I'm going to recap this board. I'm not going to film the whole thing because you don't need to see me changing out half a dozen or so caps or whatever there are here. What I one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, a dozen caps, eleven caps. You don't need to see me swapping them out. So I'm going to just do this off camera, and then we'll uh, we'll pick this up once I got all the caps changed out. There may be more damage than just the caps. You see this transistor here? It looks like there's corrosion around there. If we look on the other side, there's corrosion here too. I don't know where that came from. I don't see any other caps leaking unless it leaked out of one of these and dripped down which is a possibility but uh, hopefully there's no other damage here I guess we'll find out once I get the remaining three or the, the three remaining caps changed that I've got here uh, 10 of 47 and I don't know what that one is off there take the paint off the top here can we read that what that one says anyway Three more to go, and then we'll find out whether this works or not. That transistor fell right off the board. You have to look at it, and it just fell off. So this one here, I think it's going to be FUBAR. Uh, I can grab the preamp out of the out of the other machine and see what shape it's in. Hopefully it's in better shape than this, and that's about my only option. Because uh, I don't think changing these caps is going to fix this board with that transistor gone. Now, it might, because this might be just the flying erase head. It says FE. So this might be the flying erase section for the recorder, but then again, it won't record. It won't erase what was there before, right? FE, flying erase, head amp, right? It'll be part on here, channel one, right? That's channel one there, or one, or one A, or I guess one, that's the, that's the trick head. It's got the one with the little apostrophe beside it. And, um, and then the other one's over here. So that it might still work without that transistor in there. But that's looks like it's in the flying erase. You can see here. One CH, like the one with the little squiggle. And if you look on here, you've got one, two, and one with the squiggle, like a apostrophe. Looks like apostrophe, yeah. One, two, one with apostrophe. These are the sections of the amplifier here channel head, head channel one channel two and the other one over here and then this is the the flying erase section looks like it's bordered from here for flying erase head so it may not need that circuit for playback and for someone just looking for a machine for playing back their tapes that may be okay to not touch that and just leave it if it doesn't erase it doesn't erase but Obviously, if it doesn't erase, it's not going to record either because these machines all have flying erase heads. They don't have a, a linear head. It's just flying erase. So without that, it's not going to record. Or it's going to record. It's just going to record poorly because it's not going to erase the, the previous recording that's on the tape. I may be further ahead just to do the other preamp. And it's interesting because this other preamp, this, this cap's fallen off, but it has different parts on it. It doesn't have the same parts. For one, it doesn't have a capacitor here for C026, and it doesn't look like one's been removed. It doesn't look like there was ever one installed there. C23 has got a solid cap in place of an electrolytic. It has no C21. 
So um, they're both the same model, but one might be a newer revision than the other, and they've just changed it out. So maybe it's just further ahead just to swap out the, the caps on here, on this one, and we'll try this board and just see what the hell happens. Because at least this one here, this section isn't missing. And this one here, it's got corrosion on the bottom as well. And this one here, of course, won't have that corrosion. So maybe we might just rebuild this one. You see this one's looking nice and clean. It doesn't have corrosion down here. It looks like they put tape on here as well. This definitely looks like a newer design. And it is. Uh, look at the part number on here. It's both RP69, but one's, one is 1-828-692-14. And this one's 6-2. Uh, dash 15, 692 dash 15. So this is obviously a, a, a later revision and they made some changes. So let's just, I'm going to just pull the, the, the caps I put in here. We'll put them on this one here and we'll try this one just because this one's got, I say, the damage over here. We'll, we'll do that and uh, we'll try that and see whether that makes it work. Uh, because I like, I'd like to, to work properly in all, since I'm charging for the repair, I'd like this to work properly in every aspect. And I mean, it's not going to be a cheap repair, that's for sure. <laughs> the fellow might turn around and tell me to keep it. Who knows? But uh, we got to make it work. We got to do something to see whether it'll actually work. We got to try something. So, got to change out the parts and then go from there. You can't just guesstimate. You can't say it's going to cost X number of dollars to fix it without actually changing parts to see whether it is going to fix it. Because, well, you can get in over your head if you guesstimate and tell someone, oh, it's going to be $100 to fix it. And then you spend 20 hours on it. I've done that before. I've got a machine here right now that's been sitting here for a long time that I gave an estimate on that even if I were to repair it for what I told them and I gave them a high estimate, I'm still going to lose my shirt for the amount of time that's been spent on it. Um, to give an accurate estimate, you basically have to repair it. And then someone could turn around and say, don't fix it. And then you're out your time. But that's really the only way to do it. You can't really, without changing parts you can't really uh, you, know, you don't know until you start changing parts this one here I'm sure these ones are all bad on here too I'm checking, I'm checking with the ESR meter but I'm sure that they're that they're all alts are going to be all just bad yep open open 19 ohms open open so they're all bad but it doesn't have as many parts in it that's for sure but We'll swap the ones over and just see whether this one will work. I think a little, a little bit more confident getting this one going than this one here that's got parts falling off of it. Good thing is I can just easily pop the parts out of here and pop them into this one. So I swapped all the caps over, over to this board and uh, we're going to give this a try and see whether it works. That's more like it. All right, snap the cover on. Nothing's touching, which is good. All right, now I can plug this back in. Slide the board back in place. And it goes in like that. And then the, the uh, video head plugs in. It works. It actually works good. I haven't even checked the alignment and well it's working. It's actually working very good. Search forward. Search backwards. These don't have great, didn't have great search. Oh, I guess I got to tweak the alignment. I'm a little bit off on my alignment. I'll put the uh, scope on it. We'll check the alignment out. It's a little bit off. I'm going to put the other head drum back in first. 
I think, before I do this. The, the alignment's not too bad on this one, but I'm going to pop the other one back in. Put the original one back, just to keep it original. Just give me a minute to swap the head drum. Well, I was going to swap the head drum back, but then I looked at this, and as you can see, this is the original one. The leakage from the capacitors had leaked into that connector. Let's take a look at that preamp board again. I didn't even notice that until I was just going to swap it back and then realize that this, this one's FUBAR. As you can see, the traces are all eaten away. Now that plugs in down here. This just became a much more expensive repair because um, in addition to rebuilding the, the preamp, which ended up being the preamp from the other one because this one here had uh, uh, damage down here to the flying erase, uh, also has damage in this connector because this plugs in, how does this sit in? It plugs in like this. So that damage is right down inside here. But uh, you can see it clearly that that is shot. That's eaten away. So I'm not going to bother swapping it back because I can guarantee you it's not going to work. So we'll just do the alignment on this one and I'll let the guy know, yes, he needs a lower drum. The head's probably okay on this. But the lower drum was FUBAR because of corrosion, as you will see, as you see here. And this preamp was FUBAR because uh, corrosion on the board and all the caps that were leaking. So it needs a preamp, it needs a head drum, and it needed the transport fix. This is a major repair. So um, I don't know whether the fellow's going to want to fix this or not. It's working now, but uh, as I say, it's uh, certainly not going to be an inexpensive repair. And he may just turn around and say he doesn't want the thing back. Because and then I'll just turn around and sell the thing for, for uh, the cost of the repair. Or hang on to it as a spare which is always a good one to have. It's always good to have 8mm machines, but um, I'll leave that up to the fellow that owns it. As I say, I don't really need it, and I would be happy to, to, to fix it for him, but we've got a lot of, a lot of parts on this that, that uh, had to be replaced. They had to be replaced. All those caps and the, and the, uh, the preamp, the head drum, and, of course, fixing the mechanism. I'll throw this grounding strap back on here as well. This is just to dissipate any uh, static that picks up on the on the, the uh, head drum. And I'll hook the scope up and we will do the alignment using this head drum. See the the, the it wasn't bad. It's not bad considering that when I was trying to align it before, I only had one head working, but um, let's set it up. I'll show you how bad it is. It's not bad. As you can see, it's, um, it's pretty good. This is going to tweak up quite nicely within like a few seconds. As soon as I can find my adjustment tool, it's just the exit side guide. This has to be tweaked a bit like that and then the entry side guide this is on the left side like that there you go that's about as good as you're ever going to get off of one of these machines which is pretty much perfect I didn't bother to hook up my trigger don't need it that is um, a fix for this one and I thought the mode switch was giving me trouble but it looks like it's fine it's just operating it a few times and it's working out okay. It's not giving me a still frame, it's giving me a blank screen. Uh, I'm not too worried about that. If everything else is working, except for pause, you don't need pause when you're dubbing tapes. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. And I'm not even going to bother checking it out for record. 
not that I don't think anybody would make any recordings on something like this. It does not have a tuner in it. You have to give it video in. I don't think anybody would be making recordings on a machine like this. It probably does record, but um, I don't know that I need to try. Maybe we'll try it just for, for shits and giggles, as they say. I'll just throw my other tape in, and I'll plug my color bar generator into it, and we'll see if it makes a recording. I'm sure it will. Okay. We'll just make sure I don't rewind this tape. Okay, I'm going to go to record right at this point. I'll reset my counter. I'll put my music, plug my music back in. So it's got something to record. Okay, record. I have to make a note on here. Do not rewind this tape. This tape is shot. Like most of the tapes I've got in the shop here, they uh, go in machines of unknown uh, unknown problems. And sometimes I'll go in a machine that uh, has had something sticky on it from a prayer tape. Okay, let's see if this plays back. Okay, play back. But there's my color bars. You can see all the damage. You see all the damage on the tape? That's why I'm just going to fast forward on this tape, get past this damage section. Get way past this damage section. We'll try the recording again. And we'll play it back. And it should start in about, there we go. Again, you see all the creases and damage on this tape. This is probably fingernail against the tape to clean heads. And it scratches the tape. Again, this is the garbage tape. That's something I recorded before of some sharks. Yeah, sharks playing in the ocean down in California on a video I did down there shot in 4K. So it actually looks pretty good in 4K. Anyway, this one's this one's fixed. Um, it records, it plays. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.